So far in our discussion on ion channels, we focused on two types of ion channels. We discussed voltage-gated ion channels and ligand-gated ion channels. Now we move on to a slightly different category of ion channels we call gap junctions. Now gap junctions are also known as cell-to-cell -cell channels and we'll see why in just a moment. Now, although gap junctions are in fact ion channels, they have very different properties from the properties of voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels. And there are five important things that differentiate gap junctions from voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels. So let's begin by comparing and contrasting these uh, different types of ion channels. So voltage-gated channels and ligand-gated channels are actually closed when that membrane is at rest. And they're only open when that membrane is excited by some type of stimulus. Now, when they do open, they're only open for a very short period of time, about a millisecond or so. And then they're quickly closed off or they're inactivated. And the size of the pore inside these channels is actually very, very small. And that's why only small inorganic ions can pass across. And finally, these ion channels are usually very specific to the type of ions they allow across that membrane. Now, what about gap junctions? Well, unlike voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels, these gap junctions actually have relatively large pore sizes, so the diameter is about 20 angstroms. On top of that, they also allow the movement of not only inorganic ions, so ions like calcium, sodium, potassium, uh, chloride ions across that particular channel, but they also allow the movement of organic substances such as glucose molecules, amino acids, as well as nucleotides. So we see, unlike the voltage-gated and, and ligand-gated ion channels, which are usually specific and can only move these inorganic ions, gap junctions are non-specific. They allow any molecule to move across or any ion to move across as long as it's not too large. So large substances such as proteins and polynucleotides and polysaccharides, these molecules cannot pass across gap junctions. Now, unlike these voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels, which are only open for about a millisecond before being closed or inactivated, these gap junctions can be open anywhere from seconds to minutes. Now, voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels connect the cytoplasm of a cell to the outside extracellular environment, but we see that these gap junctions actually connect two adjacent cells, and more specific, they transverse the membrane of these two adjacent cells and they connect the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of that contiguous adjacent cell. So gap junctions transverse to membranes of contiguous cells. That simply means the cells are very close in proximity, closely packed to one another, and they connect the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of the adjacent cell. And this can be seen in the following diagram. So this entire structure that transverses the membrane of one cell and the membrane of the adjacent cell and also transverses this intercellular space, this is a single gap junction. So this is the cytoplasm of one cell and this is the cytoplasm of that adjacent cell. And the length of this gap junction is about 35 angstroms. And the final aspect, the final difference between the voltage-gated uh, and ligand gate channels and the gap junctions is that these ion channels are produced by single type of cell. But gap junctions are actually produced by two cells and we'll see why in just a moment. So let's move on to actually discuss what the structure of this gap junction is. So notice we have these two individual structures which are connected end to end inside that intercellular space. So each of these structures is known as a hemichannel or a connexin. And we see that a single gap junction consists of these two hemichannels, also known as connexins, that are connected end to end to basically form this single gap junction.
Now, if we examine each one of these hemichannels, each one of these hemichannels actually consists of six individual polypeptide chains we call connexins. And these connexins are basically formed to form a hexamer, which basically means we have six individual units within that hemichannel. Now, cell number one produces hemichannel number one, and cell number two produces hemichannel number two, and then they connect them to form that gap, uh, that gap junction. And so that's the final difference between these voltage-gated and ligand-gated on channels and gap junctions. Now, what exactly, well, actually, before we examine the functionality of these gap junctions, let's discuss how these gap junctions are actually regulated by our cells. Because just like voltage-gated and ligand-gated on channels have to be regulated for the proper functionality of the cells, these gap junctions, too, have to be regulated. And there are four methods by which we can actually close off these gap junctions. So we can close off these gap junctions by either increasing the concentration of the, pot uh, of the calcium, increasing the concentration of the H plus ion, so the, the same thing as saying lowering the pH. Number three is there are special hormones that can basically induce the process of phosphorylation of these gap junctions, and that too can close off the gap junction. And number four is, in some cases, changing the voltage difference can also actually close off these gap junctions. Now, why would we want to actually close off a gap junction? Well, let's suppose we have two cells which are connected by these gap junctions, and one of the cells is damaged in some way and ends up dying. So to basically prevent the second nearby healthy cell from being damaged, that dying cell will want to close off these gap junctions. And that's exactly where these different processes come into play to close off that gap, ju uh, uh, that gap junction. Now, finally, let's move on to the functionality of gap junction. So there are three important functions that we're going to take a look at. Function number one, intercellular communication. Function number two, cell nourishment. And function number three, embryological development. So let's focus on uh, function number one, intercellular communication. This simply means communication between adjacent cells. So let's take a look at example number one. Let's take a look at our heart. So in our heart, we have these specialized muscle cells we call cardiac myocytes or simply cardiac muscle cells. And these cardiac muscle cells are closely packed. So they are contiguous in nature. And because of that, many of these cardiac muscle cells are connected by these gap junctions. So what's the function of these gap junctions? Well, basically, when one cell receives an action potential, as a result of these gap junctions, the action potential can actually propagate into nearby cardiac myocytes. And what that does is it allows the creation of a continuous and a forceful contraction of the entire heart, and that allows the heart to pump all the blood throughout the cardiovascular system. Now, another example of these intercellular communications via gap junctions in is in the, in the muscle cells of the uterus. So if a woman is about to give birth, so that uterus must contract. And it's these gap junctions that, allow the con that allows the contraction of that uterus muscle. Now, another area that uses gap junctions to basically communicate between nearby cells is inside the brain. So inside the brain, certain types of nerve cells don't actually use neurotransmitters to send action potential from one cell to another. Instead of using neurotransmitters, they actually use gap junctions. So on the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell, they're connected by these gap junctions, and that allows the quick movement of the action potential from one cell, the presynaptic neuron, to the other cell, that postsynaptic neuron. Now, let's move on to function number two, cell nourishment. So, every single cell in our body needs things like glucose, amino, acid, amino um, acids, nucleotides to actually survive and function correctly. 
Now, not all of these cells actually are found next to capillaries, and that means not all cells in our body can actually directly obtain the nutrients they need from the body, and that's where these gap from the capillaries, and that's where these gap junctions actually come into play. Certain cells which are found far away from capillaries, so cells in our bone and cells in our eye, for instance, basically depend on gap junctions to receive the proper nutrients such as glucose and nucleotides and amino acids in order to actually survive and function correctly. And the final function is embryological development. So things like differentiation and setting, of the, and setting up the polarity of cells basically depends on the presence of gap junctions. And if we block the function of gap junctions, that embryo will not be able to develop into that adult individual. And so we see that these gap junctions, although they are a category of ion channels, they're very different than the voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels that we fo uh, focused on previously.